From Arcadia, California, The Carter Report presents the living word around the world. Hello, I'm Dave Dino, and this is The Carter Report with pastor and evangelist John Carter. This is where we talk about the issues of the Christian life. Today, we're going to talk about the issues that matter perhaps the most to you because we're going to take your questions and we're going to answer them straight ahead. Don't go away. I wish you would come with me to a land of more than a billion souls. All in need of hearing the gospel of Christ. Did you know this, my friend? It is the duty of the Christian to take the gospel of Christ to a lost world. And the lost world I'm talking about right now is India, land of millions and millions of pagan gods, but more than a billion lost souls. India cries out for God. We are now back on India TV. We're broadcasting on prime time in India. We need your prayers. We need your support. Is it easy in India? No, it's the hardest place we have ever worked. Harder than Russia, harder than Russia. Harder than America, harder than America. Harder than Australia, harder than Australia. Because it is a land that's given over almost totally to demonism. Now, I can tell you about those demons. I can tell you about the false gods, but what I want to tell you today is about the true God and the true God who told us, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. We're back in India. Yes, we're back in India. And by the grace of God, we're back in India to stay. We want you to come with us. We want you to pray for India. We want you to give for India and do it today. Please write to me. John Carter, Post Office Box 1900, Thousand Oaks, California. Write to me at Terrigal in Australia. Email me, contact me and say, yes, I'm going to stand with you in the preaching of the gospel to the lost souls of India. Thank you in Jesus' name and God bless you. Welcome to the Carter Report. Today, a program that we are titling More Hot Potatoes. Now, that's because we had a previous program called Hot Potatoes, where we answered viewer questions. Today, more questions from the mailbag. Real questions from real people about the real issues of life. Before we get started, I want you to know that many of the questions that you will hear are also answered in our magazine, Ebenezer. I encourage you to get a free copy of this. It's yours simply by going to our website, www.carterreport.org. Some great and fascinating articles in here and a section of questions and answers today, very much like what you're going to hear and see on the program. John, this is perhaps the most exciting time that we can spend together because we're not talking about the issues that you and I may perhaps mm -hmm. say, oh, let's cover this. But we're talking about real life questions from real life people about real life dilemmas. And some of these questions, Dave, are controversial. Mm -hmm. uh, we could have said, well, we're, we're just going to put those aside, but we're going to answer them because we believe they're important. And not only are they important to the people who are asking them, they're probably important to millions of other people as well. We're going to cover things like abortion, marriage, womanizing, near-death experiences, uh, the age of the universe, and we've got several yes. others. I want to mm. begin with a question that was sent in to us from Chisomo. She writes, Is there hope for me? My spiritual life has become so bad lately. I know the truth, but it is not sanctifying me. And we're going to talk about that word sanctifying in just a moment. She says, I want to return to the God of my childhood. I need to overcome. I need grace to be a real Christian. I want to be a child of God. Where do we begin? What would you say to her? I think she's a very honest lady. Mm. Uh, she's opening up a heart. And I believe she's in a position where God can bless her. 
I would say this to her. I've been a pastor for a few years now, Dave, for more than 50 years. 50 years ago, I made a vow to God that every day I would spend time reading the Scriptures. Mm -hmm. By the grace of God, even when I've been traveling, I have kept that vow. The Bible teaches that we are sinners. We're born with sinful human natures and we need the grace of God. And the way that the grace of God is bestowed upon us, given to us, Mm -hmm. is largely through the reading of the Scriptures. Before you read the Scripture, Mm. you've used the word the grace of God. How do you Mm. define that? The grace of God, uh, well, of course, uh, the old saying is uh, grace is God's unmerited favour toward us. Mm -hmm. Uh, Grace is God's mercy in dealing with us sinners. Mm. It's how God gets us from this place into his place. Okay. And Jesus said this in Matthew chapter 4 and verse 4. It is written, man shall not live on bread alone, mm-hmm. but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. Jesus said we needed to, we needed to feed on the word of God because it is the word of God is the bread of life. If I don't feed on the bread of life, I'm going to just, in my soul, Dave, I'm going to shrivel up and die. We live in a, in a world where we are bombarded by carnality, left, right, and center. We turn on the television. Most of it is just carnality. Mm-hmm. It is sin. It is pouring out and it goes into our souls And we've got to have some defences against the world in which we live. Mm -hmm. And therefore, we need to have some time every day for God and for Christ and to feed on the Word of God. Dave, in every Christian soul, there are two natures that are striving for the mastery. There's the old nature of self and sin, and we're born with it, Dave. And then there's a new spiritual nature that God puts into our hearts when we become born again. The nature that you feed is the nature that is going to win the battle in your life. If you feed on carnality, if you feed on the the gunk that comes out of the television tube, if you feed on sensuality and violence, you'll become sensual and violent. By beholding, we are changed. People say, it doesn't matter what you look at. That's nonsense. What you look at turns you into what you're looking at. Mm -hmm. But if you feed on God's Word 30 minutes a day, if you feed on Christ, then the Word of God will get inside you and this lady will find that she will become a new person. What you said sparks a thought for me. Mm. So many of us are into physical fitness. Yes. You know, 30 minutes a day yes. of exercise got to. is so good for us. Yeah, got to. How about 30 minutes of spiritual exercise? Uh, David, Dave, you, you're absolutely correct. Um, I'm into physical exercise and you are too because I, I want to stay as strong as I can for mm-hmm. as long as I can. Mm-hmm. Uh, you've got to do the same spiritually. You've got a spiritual nature. You got to feed it. You got to exercise it. You got to feed it on the Word of God. You've got to share your faith. You need to go to church. You need to pray. And if this lady will do this and stop walking by emotion, most people just go by their emotions, Mm -hmm. by their gut feelings. You can't trust your emotions. You got to learn to walk by faith. And if you walk by faith with Jesus, you're going to become strong. And you're going to win the battle. Her one question could be a whole program, but oh, we're going we're gonna to move along. Mm. This comes from Maggie. It's a bit of a long question. Yes. Pastor Carter, first, thank you for all that you do in the name of Jesus Christ. I want you to answer me this question. Why does the Seventh-day Adventist Church continue with a pro-choice policy and allow their SDA hospitals to perform abortion on the scale of the Holocaust. I am 100% against abortion, and I take issue with the church's policy. 
What I cannot understand is why pastors such as yourself are not calling out the church leaders on this issue. I believe that God gave us the commandment not to murder and that we should obey it. Please tell me, Pastor Carter, because I believe you are a real man of God. How can I be part of this church when it goes against what I believe God has commanded of us? I left Catholicism when I saw the light of its paganism and ungodly practices, and at first it was hard because I was so indoctrinated through 12 years of Catholic school and church. However, I want to be for Christ. I want to be in Christ and do his will. Please tell me why the Seventh-day Adventist Church's pastors have not stood up against this issue and changed its policy. Uh, That's a tough question. Uh, Maggie, I hope that I can help you. Firstly, let me say this. I'm not a spokesperson for the church. So I'm not authorized to say uh, the church ought to do this and the church ought to do that. Mm. Let me read you uh, a statement from the Adventist church Mm -hmm. on abortion. This is an official uh, statement. The church does not serve as conscience for individuals. That's pretty important. The church doesn't serve as my conscience. Mm-hmm. God is my is the person who dictates my conscience, mm-hmm. not the church. But some might say, but the church is his, his instrument here. Uh, well, that's a, a good point, Dave, but I would counter by saying we're not saved by the church ah. because the church needs salvation. Mm-hmm. The church needs to be saved, so how can the church save me? that God has raised up his church on on the earth. You and I believe this. But I'm saved not by looking to the church or the leaders of the church, Mm -hmm. but by looking to Christ. Mm -hmm. There's no other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. Acts chapter 4, verse 12. And let me read you this statement. Mm -hmm. The church does not serve as conscience for individuals. This is from the church leadership. Mm -hmm. However, it should provide moral guidance. Abortions for reasons of birth control, gender selection, or convenience are not condoned by the church. So the Adventist church does not believe in abortion on demand. Women at times, however, may face exceptional circumstances that present serious moral or medical dilemmas such as significant threats to the pregnant woman's life, serious jeopardy to her health, severe congenital defects carefully diagnosed in the fetus and pregnancy resulting from rape or incest. The final decision whether to terminate the pregnancy or not should be made by the pregnant woman after appropriate consultation. She should be aided in her decision by accurate information, biblical principles, and the guidance of the Holy Spirit. Moreover, these decisions are best made within the context of healthy family relationships. Therefore, I would say to Maggie, Maggie, I'm not a, an authority on, on the teachings of, of the church leadership. I'm not here to, to be an authority on that, but the church does not teach abortion on demand. That is very plain. But let me tell you, she said, now, why don't you do more? Well, firstly, Maggie, let me say this to you. Let me look at you, Maggie. Let me look you in the eye. I am not associated with any hospital. I have no influence upon any hospital. I don't sit on any hospital boards. I do not know what goes on in hospitals. I just don't have anything to do with it. But let me tell you now personally what I believe. Mm -hmm. I believe in the sacredness of human life. And I think the Adventist church believes that also. But before before mm -hmm. you go to that, I want to come back to that in just a moment. And I want people to understand your view personally 
uh, and, and how the Bible talks with this. Mm. We're going to take a break for just a moment to catch our breath because this is quite a topic. It sure is. We'll be back in just a moment here on The Carter Report. Did you ever have a sense of destiny? Did you ever feel that God has put his hand upon you for some tremendous task, that you've really got a purpose, that God has called you for such a time as this? I have that sense, that conviction today because God is opening up doors for us in Latin America. And in Latin America, my good friend, there's a revolution going on. It's not a revolution in the streets. It is a revolution in the hearts of men and women. That's why the Carter Report is going to go to El Salvador. We are renting an outdoor stadium with room for more than 60,000 souls. And we're planning a baptism in the, on the Sabbath afternoon of more than 5,000 born again souls in El Salvador, in Latin America, where there's a revolution going on, where the Holy Spirit is being poured out. Don't you want to be a part of this great purpose, this great task, this God-designed uh, outreach to Latin America? Would you please write to me, John Carter, Post Office Box, 1900 Thousand Oaks, California. Tell me, I'm going to support you. Write to me in Australia. Tell me, I'm going to support the preaching of the gospel. Write to me today and support the preaching of the Word of God around the world. But right now, in Latin America, thank you and God bless you. Welcome back to The Carter Report with pastor and evangelist John Carter. I'm Dave Dino, and today we're talking about hot potatoes, more hot potatoes. It's a program where we are picking up some of our listeners' letters and answering their questions. And we are right in the middle of perhaps one of the most controversial issues of our day and age, and that is the issue of abortion. And the question has come in from Maggie, pastor, about why do Seventh-day Adventist churches allow abortion? when it is so anathema to us as Christians. And you were about to share your own personal view and take a look at Scripture. Uh, once again, I'd say to the TV audience, Dave, the Adventist church does not believe officially in abortion on demand. What is done in hospitals, I don't know. I have no association with them. But I will tell Maggie what I personally believe on this subject. Mm -hmm. I turn to Jeremiah chapter 1, verse 4 and 5. The word of the Lord came to me saying, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I set you apart. I appointed you as a prophet to the nations. Our sovereign Lord, I said, I do not know how to speak. I'm only a child. Now, some people will come and say to me, well, that which is in the, the mother's womb is not very important. Uh, it is not a human being. It is a fetus. God says right there, I knew you. Mm -hmm. God knew me before I was born. And Dave, there's one big problem in our world today. The world has got so much influence and secularism is so strong here in North America and in Australia that secularism is even influencing conservative Christians mm. to go the way of the world. Mm -hmm. Let me say it to you, Maggie, you need to put your eyes on Jesus and you need to follow Christ. Christ saves you. Another question. And this gets right down into the heart of how do I know that I'm a Christian? It comes from Isaac. How can I be sure I am a part of Christ? Does my behavior have anything to do with my salvation? Somebody said, Dave, as, as I turn up a text in Matthew 7, you don't have to be saved. You don't, you don't have to be good to be saved. 
but you do need to be saved to be good. <laughs> so you don't have to be good to be saved, but mm-hmm. you do need to be saved to be good. Mm-hmm. If a person's life is no different after he came, in quotes, to Christ than before, then he really hasn't come to Christ because coming to Christ makes a tremendous difference. Matthew 7, 21 and onwards, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and in your name drive out demons and perform many miracles? Then I will tell them plainly, I never knew you. Away from me, you evil doers. It's not just doing the talk. Mm-hmm. It's walking the walk. And when a person comes to Christ, John chapter 3, Jesus said, you've got to be born again. Mm-hmm. So when a person, Dave, is actually born again by the Holy Spirit, he becomes a new person. Oh, no, he's not a perfect person. He's going to make mistakes. He's going to stumble and fall. But he's going to be a new person. There's a new trend in the life. So remember, you don't have to be good to be saved, but you do need to be saved to be good. Let's go over to James for just a moment. Mm -hmm. I have marked this in my Bible for this very question Mm -hmm. and this discussion because we're talking about faith and works here. Yes, yes, yes. And so for many, many Christians, this is a a very difficult uh, balance to understand. Hmm. Over in James, in chapter 2, Mm-hmm. Beginning at verse 14. I'll just take two of the verses yes. that deal with this. Verse 14. What use is it, my brother, if a man says he has faith, but he has no works? Can that faith save him? Mm-hmm. And then later in verse 17, even so faith, if it has no works, mm. is dead, being by itself. Mm, that's quite a text, isn't it? It is. Yeah. Mm. So what are we to believe about the relationship between faith and works. We read in Ephesians, we are not saved by works. We are saved by faith, and even that faith is given to us by God. Yes, it is. We're not saved by faith. We're saved through faith. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, I'm not saved by faith and works, but I am saved by a faith that works. A genuine faith will demonstrate itself in obedience to God. Mm -hmm. Now, the false prophets were great, and many people today are great at talking about Jesus. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord, brother. A lot of talk about Jesus, but there's no walking the walk. So what you've read there, you know, is so pertinent, Dave. True Christianity changes me and makes me a better person. It gets down to the whole issue in this faith and works. It gets back over to fruit as Mm -hmm. well. Mm Mm-hmm. It is one thing to say, I believe, but if your life has no fruit, Hmm. then perhaps not so much to others should they believe you're a Christian, but perhaps you need to take a look at that yourself. Hmm. Absolutely. Uh, Somebody said, uh, I don't know who said it, but an apple doesn't make an apple tree. An apple tree makes apples. Mm -hmm. So if you're, once once the power of God comes inside you, then the apples are going to come on the tree. Hmm. We have just a moment left, and I want to cover Hmm. one more question. We have about two minutes or so left in our time together. Uh, This comes from Sam. Dear sir, the Bible clearly teaches that liars will not go to heaven. Verses like Revelation 21, 8. Mm -hmm. Why then do so many Christians seem to not worry about being untruthful? Well, we're getting some tough ones today. I mean... Ouch. Yeah, I know. Um, I live in, I've worked in Los Angeles for 25, 26 years. Um, It has a name for being a a culture that uh, does a lot of lying. But some of the most honest people I've met in my life are in Los Angeles. Hmm. Uh, Willie Jordan of the Fred Jordan mission, straight as a gun barrel. Mm -hmm, Her yes is yes, her no is no. The text he quoted in Revelation 21 says there'll be no liars in the kingdom of God. I think the answer, Dave, is this. We live in a culture that is predisposed to lying. People people lie about everything. 
But when Christ comes into your heart, the liar goes out. When Christ comes in, the liar goes out. Jesus said, let your yes be yes and your no be no. Anything more than this comes from the evil one. I believe there's an answer to this, Dave. It is the integrity that is found by genuine Christianity that comes by the grace of God through the Holy Scriptures. Mm -hmm. And that is why for years as a pastor, I've said, read your Bible every day. Mm. And if we will read our Bibles every day, the Word of God changes us. I work in the world of advertising for a good part of my day. Mm. And we have a little uh, saying, WIFM, W-I-F-M. <laughs> we live in a culture that lives by WIFM. Yeah. What's in it for me? Yeah. And as Christians, we're not immune from that. No, we're not. Mm -hmm. And therefore... Uh, we may not, we would say, not lie. We may say that we would simply, um, you know, be more convenient in what we say. Yes, yes. We come up with all kinds of ways of excusing being less than truthful. Mm -hmm. We live in a culture that is all in it for them, and it touches us in our lives. Mm -hmm. How do we fight against that and take that out of our lives? Uh, Paul said in Romans, and I think it's Philip's translation, Romans 12, he said, don't let the world around you squeeze you into its own mold. Mm -hmm. We have a pagan culture. Hey, is it new? No, what about the apostles and the early Christians mm -hmm. in the pagan Roman Empire? What about Christians in Russia, in India? and Saudi Arabia, and some of these countries which are quite opposed to Christ. One must make a conscious decision. I'm not going to allow the world around me to squeeze me into its way of thinking. I'm not going to be conformed to the ways of the I'm not going to be conformed, but I'm going to be transformed. Right, and unfortunately... We could talk for another program about this, and we've come to the end of mm. our time together. But I think that's a good place for us to, to uh, stop and let people think about that. Now, we would love to hear from you as well, and your support is what makes this program possible. You can write to us here at the Carter Report at P.O. Box 1900, Thousand Oaks, California, 91358. Elsewhere in the world, you can reach us at P.O. Box 861, Terrigal, NSW, 2260, Australia. You can email us at info at carterreport.org and take a look at our website, www.carterreport.org. This has been such a great moment to be with you. We hope it has been very helpful for you. John, thank you so much. Thank you, Dave. Thank you for joining us.